Praise the Lord, everybody. Last week, we we left off on apostles. We left off. We left off on the qualifications of an apostle and the reasons why we don't have apostles today. The next thing that God has given the church then is prophets. And I think that many people have taken what they think a prophet is and kind of spun it around and made some kind of a new position of a prophet. When we usually think about prophets, the thing that comes to mind is Old Testament prophets and them predicting scary things, the future. So let me ask you this. If I tell you that the Lord is coming soon, am I telling you the future? Am I a prophet? Now, with that question, there was only two possible answers, yes and no, and I heard both, so somebody's wrong. I even saw some heads doing that. All right, well, let's, let's take a look at what a prophet is, and then we'll find out whether pastors today are prophets or not. She said, some call themselves all kinds of things. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. But that doesn't make them what they say they are. If you look in your Bible, prophecy is spelled two ways. One is prophesy and one is prophecy. There's P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y and P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y. Why? They're not the same thing. Prophecy, CY, is used almost exclusively in the Old Testament. Prophecy. But now, let me tell you what the definition is. And I will say this, even though most of the Old Testament prophecy was considered predictive, and I'll tell you why it's considered predictive, because they were telling people what was going to happen. So it, in essence, was them predicting the future, but they weren't really predicting anything. They were only declaring what God had told them. So it wasn't like they had some kind of insight into what was going on. They went and told. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord has spoken and said. God said. The Lord has said. That's what they would say. So it wasn't like they had some kind of unique insight into something. They were simply telling what God had told them to say. She said, is that the same thing as forth-telling? No, it's not. That was foretelling. Forth-telling is S-Y. Foretelling is C-Y. The word prophecy means this. The declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means, the foretelling of the will of God, or forth-telling of the will of God, whether with reference to the past the present, or the future. It is simply declaring what God has said. I can say it this way. It's prophecy, then, to stand up and tell what God has done. It is prophecy to tell what God is doing. It is prophecy to tell what God is going to do. 
Preachers today act very much in that role. We tell people what God has done. We tell people what God is doing. And we warn them about what God is going to do. There is a big difference, though. We do it from what God has already recorded. We know what he has done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do, because it's all right here. I think people today try to turn it into this predictive kind of thing, almost like witchcraft kind of stuff. It's disturbing to me. They want to sit around and act like God is giving them some kind of personal insight into someone. But I can assure you that if God tells us that it is a sin to gossip, he's not going to turn around and gossip his own self. God's not going around telling people everybody's business. Almost always, God spoke to the nation, not the individuals. Now, what then about when God sent the prophet to the king? Isn't that to an individual? Sort of. But the king set the tone for the nation. God went to the leader to get the people straight. There are a few occasions where God would deal with an individual. For example, when David had an affair with Bathsheba and had had her husband put to death, God sent Nathan to David to tell him what he did that was wrong. Was he predicting the future? No. He had insight because God told him what David had done but he wasn't predicting the future and he wasn't gossiping. David had gotten out of order. Well, it's pretty serious what he did. He not only committed adultery, he had a man put to death and had him carry his own death sentence with him. What he said for Uriah to do, David's generals sent back another letter and said, are you sure you want us to do this? If we do this, surely this man is going to die. And David sent word back, yeah, do it. So it wasn't like he didn't have time to think about it or once the messenger was gone, he didn't have an opportunity to stop him. Oh, no, 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 no. He did it twice. So he willfully and deliberately took this man's life. So God sent someone to him because he was the head of the people and told him what he did, what he did wrong, and that God's going to give you a punishment of one of these three things. And you can pick. And David said, oh, no, 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 no. God is surely merciful. You let God say what he's going to do to me. Because God will have mercy on me. Now, that says something about the character of this man. Even though he knew he was wrong, he still had confidence that God would do right. Some of us get wrong because we don't have confidence that God is doing right. We feel like God is shortchanging us. We feel like God is not being fair. We will feel like God is not giving me my just desserts. He's not rewarding me for all the work that I'm doing for him. We kind of get these attitudes. And then we will walk out on God. But David had enough sense to know, even though I messed up, God is going to be righteous. God is going to be fair. And he'll pick the easiest punishment. I, I remember when I was a child and cutting up, sometimes my mother would tell me, I'll give you a choice. You can be on punishment for a week or you can get a whipping. Now, what do you think I did? 
I took the whooping every time. It wasn't even, it wasn't even open for question. Like, go, I'll go get the belt. After a while, she caught on to that. So she would say, you can have a whipping or a week's punishment in your room. I said, I'll take the whipping. She said, no, you won't. Go on upstairs. You in your room. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> I was picking what I thought was the easiest. My mother did not like to give spankings. So she was giving me the choice. And if I let her pick, she was going to give me the punishment because then she didn't have to give me a spanking. Well, David knew God is very much like this. Whatever he does to you, it's going to be seasoned with mercy. Whatever his punishment is, he'll do it with mercy. I'm liable to jump out and pick something, a punishment, and not realize I'm picking the worst thing I could pick. In Nehemiah, in the Old Testament, we had prophets, right? Is that correct? We had prophets. Well, let's see what the prophets did. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse number 7. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. What did he go do? What did this prophet go do? He went and preached. He wasn't going to predict the future or tell him that something, his season was about to happen, his harvest was about to come in. He wasn't doing all of that. God told the prophet, go preach. All right. Book of Jonah. I can tell by the way folks is nodding their head at me that they, they just don't believe me. This is just a one-time event. Well, let's see. In the book of Jonah, chapter number 3, verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and prophesy. Oh, I'm sorry. And preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Jonah was a prophet, wasn't he? But what's his job? Preach. All right, let's, let's grab one more. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter two, verse number five. Um well no, hold on. Second Peter two and And, and, and four and five. And if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, just stop there. What did Noah preach for a hundred years? He preached the flood is coming. Isn't that predicting the future? But I thought he was a preacher and not a prophet. Yes. We today mix these positions up and try to turn them into something mystical. But the Old Testament prophets... They were preachers. These men preached what God told them to preach. They didn't walk up 
and talk, come to somebody and do all this hokey stuff that these preachers are doing today, acting like they're all anointed and uh, God has spoken to me, thus saith the Lord. And that's something that I really have a problem with too. When God is prophesying, how come he speaks in King James English? You ever notice that? The Lord spoke to me and told me to tell you, yea, God hath done a great thing in thy life. I'm like, God don't talk like that. He doesn't speak that way. That's people trying to impress you that they're speaking very biblical, therefore what they're saying must be true. God didn't talk like that. That's something that we do to impress people. What did the prophets do? Preached. They preached about what was coming. They preached about what... Well, here. Go to the book of Jude. Uh, yep, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, deeds which they have ungodly committed and of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh, speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. What was he preaching or prophesying? The Lord's coming back with ten thousands of his saints, and he's going to execute judgment on the world. What do we preach today? The Lord is coming back and he's going to execute judgment on this world. Aren't we preaching the same thing? He was prophesying. What are we doing? <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, 14 and 15 and 16. And more so... Um, 14 and 15 because it really gets to the heart of what his message was about. It was about the judgment of God coming to execute judgment on those who were ungodly. And we are living today in one of the most ungodly societies on this planet there's someone that would argue with me and say, well, you haven't been to every society on this planet. Well, I can't say that I've been to every society, but I know the one I'm living in, we're pretty much doing everything Sodom and Gomorrah did. Does anybody know what they did? You don't? Well, then go to the book of Ezekiel. Somebody that's got an electronic Bible, help me find that. It says this, oh, I found it, 16, chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49 and 50. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. The first thing on the list, pride. You think this isn't a proud nation? We're very proud. We are extremely haughty. We are. We think we're the best at everything. We feel like, and this is what's so shameful about the way we are, we feel like we make the best of everything, but we're buying it all from other countries. Someone came to me and was rebuking me about my car. I can't believe you're buying a Toyota. You should have bought an American-made car. I said, what do you drive? I, buy, I drive a Chevy. 
I said, well, Chevys are made in Mexico and assembled in other parts of the world. Toyotas are 100% assembled in the United States of America. I am buying American made. We too silly to even know. We just doing this. Pride. Running our mouth about stuff, about how good we are, and don't realize who we are. Pride, fullness of bread. We have so much food, we throw it away. Now I'm about to get in trouble with my wife on this one. Amen. We throw away food because it says sell by and have a date on there. We throw away food because it says best if used by and it puts a date on there. We'll throw away food because it says expires on. Food don't expire that easy. It don't spoil that easy. Say what? She said, why is the date on there? Because the people that make the product want to make sure that you get the freshest tasting you can get. So they put a label, uh, put a date on there so that the store knows it's got to be sold by this day or it's not at its peak flavor. Because if you buy it and it's not at its peak flavor, you might not buy it again. So that's all it is. It's got nothing to do with whether the food is no good whether it's spoiled, nothing to do with that at all. They put it on canned goods. You know how long a can of anything will last? Almost indefinitely. Once it's sealed inside that can, it's not going to spoil. But we'll go through and say, ooh, that says 2016. Throw that out. Do you know why we do that? Because you don't want to get sick. He said, she don't want to get sick. You said, what? You don't want to get salmonella? You, that's because that's what you was taught to do? Because we have a fullness of bread. That's why. If, if you were starving, you would look at that expiration date, open that can of food, cook it, pray over it, and be, Lord, please don't let me get sick, and go on and eat it. But we have so much food that we can look at it. Well, it only costs 45 cents and throw it in the garbage. We do. The Bible says that a willful waster will come to want. Some of us don't have a lot because we waste a lot. I'll tell you something. Ooh. All right. She said, go ahead. I don't have a choice now. I got to do it. I can remember when I was a kid, we'd pull bread out and it had green stuff on it. We'd just scrape the green off, throw it in the toaster, and eat it. You know why? Because I was hungry. And guess what? I ate all that penicillin and never got sick once. Still here. Still kicking. I, I killed it, you're right, in the toaster. I, I, listen, there's a lot of stuff that we think is bad because we're taught to throw it away. My Aunt Romy. <laughs> I remember her washing dishes. And when she would empty the strainer, she'd reach down in and grab that food and eat it. What? 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 She lived to be very old. She, she, she said, if I have to do that, I don't know if I want to live. That's because that's you're not in a position to have to do that. Homeless people in this country will scrounge, scrounge around in garbage cans and get food out and eat it, and they're doing okay. That's here. Because we have so much. We have a fullness of bread in this country. So much food, we don't care. We just throw it out and go get more. And if I throw away too much, I'll just go get on welfare. Let the government feed me. Well, some folks, are, they got that attitude. We feed, our government throws away food. We pitch 
We pitch so much food. We throw away so much. I, went, I can remember I was working at this place where I worked on diesel fuel pumps, and I went out to deliver one to a guy, to a man whose tractor was broken down in the field. And his field had a huge section of it, two or three times the size of this church, that had weeds growing all in it, but corn everywhere else. And I asked him, why didn't he just plow all of it and grow corn on all of it instead of just letting some go to waste like that? He said, because the government pays me to not grow on that part. You know why? Because we have so much food that it would cost nothing for us to get food. If they just grew as much as we possibly could, it would drive the prices down so cheap the farmers couldn't live. So we pay farmers to not grow food. And we still have so much, we can just throw it in the garbage. Throw good food in the garbage. I'm not saying you got to eat from the strainer. But we have so much food, we don't even think about it. All right. Are we, we, we got pride? We've got fullness of bread. Uh, there was iniquity in, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. That's the third thing. Does anybody know what idleness is? Not doing anything. So, so if you have a car, when you get to the car wash, they'll tell you, Put it in neutral. That means it's just idling. It's not doing anything. Right? We have an abundance of idleness in this country. Uh, you know how I know? Because Game Boys and Xboxes, Playstations, we've got so much idleness that we don't even play on the big consoles at home. Now we play on the little, what do they call them little things? Do you no, no, the little Game Boy things. Is that what they call them, Game Boys? Okay, Game Boys. We got Game Boys, so we can carry our we can carry our pleasure with us, our playing with us. And if you don't want to spend the money for that, you can always just get your phone out and start playing games on your phone. Most of us can. Now, some of us here still have flip phones. You can't play. Oh, hey, hey, man, I, I, I see a hand doing. You can't play no games on that. But most of us have the kind of, you say, yes, you can? Oh, boy. So we, we just carry games with us. And people complain, I don't have enough free time. I don't have enough free time. Well, they used to have to cut wood to heat their house. They had to cut wood to cook. I used to do that cut wood up, and it'd be burning up hot in the house. Cooking on a wood stove in the summertime. It's just burning up hot. You have to cook at a certain time of the day, like cook that evening when it's cooling down, and cook late into the night, and then don't start that thing up again until the next day. You just eat cold food or warm it up just enough just to get the food warm, but not enough to make it turn red hot. You had to learn all kind of tricks to not keep too hot. Now that was some work because you had to cut the wood, start a fire, and wait for the stove to get hot. Then you cooked your food, and then you had to clean it all up. But then they come out with, you know, they had these gas stoves and electric stoves. All you had to do is go turn a switch and just put your food on it. You didn't have to cut nothing. You didn't have to start no fires. It started it all by itself. But that took too much time. So now you just put it in the thing and hit a button, a couple of buttons, and walk away. And when it dings, you come back and your food is cooked. Yep, microwave. And we still don't have enough time. We still just, I don't, I don't have time to cook. We got time to do everything. We have planners to help us with our daily schedules. We go to where we work our eight or nine hours a day. We got another 16, and we use that to just do silly stuff. Hey Amen. We don't come to church and pray, do we? <coughs> All right. 
An abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. We got that real bad. What we will do is we will go to the gas station and we will put money in a jar for the victims of hurricane whatever in Puerto Rico and we will step over a homeless person to get up into the gas station and won't give them a dime. Shake our head at them and say, there's a whole lot of places hiring. Why don't you have a job? Well, we don't know what they're doing in them other countries. But we won't help anybody that's poor and needy. We get angry. We get upset. Why are they still poor? I just helped them last month. Why don't they have a job? Why aren't they out working? They must be wasting their money. And I'll tell you the, the catch with all of that that makes it so bad. We get upset with people and say, well, first, first we're upset with them until they explain their situation. Then we tell them, I'm going to pray for you that the Lord will bless you. And God starts to bless and they start to do good. Then we get upset because God's blessing them and not me. It's just silly the way we act because we have so much. We want God to bless until he starts to bless. We don't mind helping somebody as long as they can't help their self. But the moment they're able to do better, then we're mad. All right, y'all don't believe me. And they were haughty. Haughtiness is something that you can see in a person. You can tell when somebody's looking down at you, when they got a haughty attitude. Americans in a lot of countries are hated because they say that we're proud and arrogant, we're haughty. We go to other countries and demand them to do things our way. We will, we will go to England and tell them it needs to be like this because the way we do it in America is right. We're just haughty. We really are. We will go anywhere. We go to other countries to do missionary work and just, ah, uh, it's too bad they're not like us. Let me tell you how haughty we are. We will make up reasons why, make up fake stories why other countries are not as well off as we are to make us feel better about having so much. We do that. Do you remember when Hurricane Katrina came through and destroyed Louisiana, New Orleans? Not Louisiana, New Orleans. I remember one of the preachers got it. He didn't have an explanation as to why the hurricane came through and so many people had died. He got on television. I saw him, just ridiculous, talking about the reason why this happened is because back during slavery, when they were being brought here from Haiti, they sold their souls to the devil so that they could get freedom. And now it's finally coming back around. And, and this is the price that they're paying because their ancestors and like, why would God wait until five generations later? That's just silly. We just have to make up stuff. We will make up things in our own arrogance, in our own haughtiness. We will come up and manufacture reasons why people are not doing as well as I am. Number seven, and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. What is abomination? That was the homosexuality. Right now, you're hard pressed to find a TV show that doesn't have the gay person in it, the gay character. It's being shoved down our throats. It really is. I want to say this and then I want to clear some things up. 
We are being slowly fed a diet of the gay lifestyle is not so bad. It's an abomination to God. It is. It's sin. But where did it rank on this list of the sins of Sodom? It was the last one. Now, God wiped out that whole city for seven different sins. That city, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zoar. Ah, what's the other ones? I can't think of it. There were several cities. It wasn't just Sodom and it wasn't just Gomorrah. It was all of the cities around it too. He wiped them all out. Why? If you go out in the street and ask anybody, why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? The first thing they'll say is, because of the homosexuality. No, it wasn't. It was a whole lot more they were doing wrong. As a matter of fact, you don't have to look much further than your own country to see all of the things that they were doing wrong. All of it, this country is guilty of. This is a personal speculation that I have. I got no Bible to back this up. So I'm just giving you my opinion. This is the gospel according to David. Don't go out and tell anybody that the Bible says. Don't go out and tell them the pastor says. This is just my opinion. I think the only reason why that we have been spared as long as we have is because we have such a friendly relationship with Israel. We support them no matter what they do. We support them. And I believe God spares us because he's blessing them that blesses Israel. That's holding off the hand of the enemy. That's my opinion. Because I can't think of any other reason why God would tolerate the foolishness that we do in this country. We demand that God be taken out of the schools. And then we get angry when violence happens at those schools. We get angry with God. Why would God let somebody go in and kill all those kids? You didn't even want him there. We do the same thing with our government. We don't want people in the government to have any kind of moral compass or godliness at all. We want a total separation of church and state. And then when we find out that our politicians are corrupt, crooked, and perverse, why? Because we don't want God there. All right. I'm, 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 I'm through. I'm going to move on. It was a common misconception that prophets in the Old Testament went around predicting the future. That's not what their job was. Their job was to preach what God gave them to preach. Sometimes they preached about things that predicted, no, predict is not the right word, that told about events that happened before the world was. And if you look in the book of Ezekiel, I'm not sure where, it's in Ezekiel and in Isaiah, they both talk about, one of them talks about the king of Tyrus, and how, who, who he was. He was in the garden of God, covered with all type of beautiful uh, jewels. His pipes and his tablets was built into him. He was perfect in the day that he was created. The prophet was prophesying or preaching to the king that was there. Yet God hid, hid in that a revelation about the devil when he was created. So just because they prophesied about things that were going on or preached about things that were going on or going to happen didn't mean that God didn't hide something extra in there. Do we have time? We got a little time. Where is that? Do you know? In the book of Ezekiel 24, is it? Uh, 28, is it? 28 and 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways 
from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring uh, forth a fire from the midst of thee and it shall devour thee and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in sight, in the sight of all them that behold thee. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. Yes. All right, verse 13. Yeah, no, actually go to 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, so this was something that God told him to go preach or go say to the king of Tyrus. Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The Sardis stone, or the Sardis, topaz and, di and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. God made him beautiful. But who was he talking about? Well, the king of Tyrus wasn't covered with all of that in the day he was created. He didn't walk in Eden, the garden of God. But God was using this as a metaphor to the king about how beautiful and how wise he was and how he let it corrupt him and cause him to fall in the sight of God. But it was also a revelation of Satan, of Lucifer, before he fell. When God made him, he made him perfect. So the prophet is preaching about one thing and it's talking about something else. Are y'all getting that? All right. Some of you looking confused. Preachers, prophets, preachers talk about things that were, things that are, and things that, that are to come. All right. Go then to the book of Hebrews. Let's talk about the New Testament prophet. Hebrews 1 and 1. This kind of prophetic utterance where things that were predicted that were previously unknown has ended because it's been written down now. These men wrote things that had not been known before. And we call them prophets. The Bible calls them prophets, but they weren't going around predicting blessings and monetary things on people. They weren't doing that. They were teaching and preaching what God had said. It was written down. And now there are still things that have been written down that have not happened yet, but they're going to. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by prophets. When did he do it? At different sundry times, various times and in different manners, different ways, he spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets in these last days, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So where is the prophets at? He's not speaking to us like that anymore. Now he's speaking to us through his son. How? Through his word and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let's get another one. Second Peter chapter 1. Second 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, and then chapter 2 and verse 1. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Aren't we still doing that today? But, now, now he's getting ready to show us the flip side of that. But, which means, now I'm going to show you the opposite of it. But there were false prophets also among the people people even as there shall be false teachers so what are the prophets today uh-huh there were false prophets then and there's false teachers today so that role now has been filled. who's the teacher did, did, did y'all didn't catch that who's the who's the teacher well, real quick, let's see. I got it here real quick. Oh, let's see. Who is the teacher? Uh, Ephesians 4.11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So he doesn't say it all the same way. He gave some apostles. That's one and some prophets that's two and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers it's four pastors and teachers they're the same thing a pastor has to be a teacher you can be you can be a teacher without being a pastor but you cannot be a pastor without being a teacher it's one thing to get people saved. But I'm not saying this for anybody to skip Sunday. Once you get saved, once you get the Holy Ghost, you don't need to be preached to anymore. That's what gets people in. After you get the Holy Ghost, the most important thing you can get is teaching. How to serve God, how to live for God. Preaching we like because it gets us stirred up. We like to shake the dust out the carpet and and we like to run around and clap our hands and jump for joy. We like all of that. But preaching only gets people saved. You're not going to live on preaching. You're going to live on teaching. Yes, ma'am. Teaching pastors? Yeah, you got to be a teacher if you're going to be a pastor. But there are false uh, even as there are, there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So God now has changed this. So what prophet and apostles do we have today? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, a heresy is, I know what it is and I forgot. <laughs> uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you later. I'm sorry. I don't know. I know it, but I can't remember it. Um, do we have apostles and prophets today? Right here. We're still reading the apostles. We're still reading the prophets. We're still living by it, aren't we? Amen. That's when I get up and preach and teach. Who am I preaching and teaching from? The apostles and the prophets. All of that. So the church, does the church still have apostles and prophets in them? Yes. Right here in this Bible. But they're not walking around in the flesh and blood preaching and teaching. All right, Ephesians. I want to show you that once God has made a promise, he does not have to keep going back and reaffirming that promise to you. Yes, ma'am. 
She says she found the definition of heresy. That's it. It is, it is um, and I'll paraphrase it, it is to believe something that is against what the orthodox, and when they say orthodox, they mean those that strictly adhere to the Bible. It goes against that. And we do have a problem with that today. People, they would rather listen to anything, read anything other than the Bible. They don't want to, they don't want to do too much to do with the Bible. You know why? Because it's just too hard. Reading the Bible is too hard. It's just too difficult. So I, I, I don't read it. I just let God teach me. It's not like that. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What has God blessed us with? All spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places, right? God has blessed us with that. Now, when somebody comes and prophesies and says God's getting ready to bless you, well, then that means God hasn't blessed me, doesn't it? Because he said he's already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. If I'm in Christ, I'm already blessed with all spiritual blessings. The natural blessings was never promised to the church. It was promised to Israel. So for somebody to come up and tell you, God said he's getting ready to give you a car. God's getting ready to give you a house. God's getting ready to give you a raise on the job. That's natural. That's contrary to the Bible. God didn't promise you that. So why does somebody have to come up to me and say, it's about to happen. God showed me it's about to happen. All them spiritual blessings you haven't been getting, about to start getting poured on you. They don't have to do that. I've already got them. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. What is going to be multiplied in my life? Grace and peace. I don't need a prophet to come and tell me. Thus saith the Lord, yea, God is about to give you grace and peace. No, I don't need that. Why? Because he's already given it to me. Everything that I need, he's already given it. I don't have to have someone come and predict that in my life. God already said he's given it to me. Amen? All right, I got seven more minutes. Evangelist. I hope we understand the difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets were preaching, but they didn't have it already written down. The New Testament prophets are called preachers. And we preach what is already written down. The difference is one, foretold. Now we forth tell. We tell people what God has said. Not what God is going to do future tense necessarily. But what God already has had written down. If you're a prophet... How come there's not something being written in the Bible, a new Bible, about what God is saying through you? I'll tell you why. Because it's just foolishness. Live holy. Live saved. You don't have to worry about all that. All right. An evangelist, it means messenger of good, a preacher of the gospel, or a missionary. In the book of 2 Timothy 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul is instructing Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Evangelism is not something that every pastor is good at. Evangelism is something 
that I'm really not good at. But that doesn't mean that I can say, I'm not going to preach on Sundays no more. I'm going to get somebody else to come in that's a true evangelist and he's going to stir us up and get us excited and ready. No, as a pastor, Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. It doesn't have to be something that is your particular talent, but you got to do the work anyway. We do have evangelists that travel around and they preach and they're extremely gifted at what they do. They can inspire people, stir them up, bring about a God consciousness in them, and get them excited about God and walking with God. Once they do that, they need to get the Holy Ghost. And once they get that, they need a pastor to teach them. So a lot of times you will see these, these uh, national evangelists going around and folks will come and get saved, they'll get the Holy Ghost, or they'll come up and want to give their life to the Lord or whatever it is that they do. And you'll hear them at the end say, now go find a church and put your membership in and be taught by your pastor because that's truly the way it should be done. Even those that don't believe, like the Bible says, most of them will tell you, now that you have, found, now that you have received Jesus in your heart, go find a church. Amen. So an evangelist, an evangelist will, he will preach and stir up the people. That is something that is necessary for folks to get saved. It's also necessary, you know, teaching is good and it can get us it can get us in the right mindset to be saved, understand what holiness is. It'll help us to understand what it is that God is looking for in our lives. Teaching is very good, but we need to be stirred up every now and then, don't we? Amen. Amen. You don't have a pastor that's good at stirring you up, so sometimes you just got to stir your own self up. I stir me up. Yes, ma'am. She says, her question is, why is it if it's a female preacher, why is it that they put the title evangelist on her for lack of a better name to give them? An elder is a masculine term. It's not proper for a woman to be called elder. It's just, it's not just bad grammar. It's like calling a sister man. It, it's not appropriate to call a sister a brother or a man is it okay not if we want to be right so what then else can we call a female preacher well evangelist doesn't have a gender so we have settled on that that women are evangelists now some of the some of the sisters now call themselves elder but that's not appropriate I'm not saying it's sin. I'm saying it's not appropriate for them to call themselves elder because that is masculine. Unless they say, I'm the elder lady, then it's feminine, but only then. But that's not what they say. It's Elder Johnson, Elder Lori Johnson. That's not appropriate. It's masculine. So it is either the elder lady Lori Johnson, the elder sister, Lori Johnson, or evangelist. Yes, sir. What if it's a district elder? Just district elder. What if it's just district? See, trying to get me in trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be nice. To my knowledge, that's not appropriate either. Maybe we just call them district evangelists. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm teasing about that. Yes, ma'am. But they, she said they call some prophetess. There, but that prophetess is an actual title. That's feminine. Prophetess. Just like deaconess is. No, it's not the same thing. Elder. Now, maybe if they called her, call someone elder s, 
then he might be feminine. <laughs> but elder, the, ter the term elder is a noun and it's masculine unless it has something that specifies a feminine gender. And so I don't know about district elder. I would suspect that it's not appropriate either, but I wish you well on fighting that one. Yes, ma'am. She said, if prophets, um, said if prophets what? Don't exist except in the word, because prophetess is in the Bible. Right. She said, that's not who they are if they don't meet those qualifications. Well, calling someone a prophet today is an incorrect title. Calling someone a prophetess today is an incorrect title. Yes, that's incorrect. We don't have that. Calling someone an apostle is an incorrect title. People say it because they think that because they go out and plant churches, that makes them an apostle, but it doesn't. And I'm not saying that to be ugly towards anyone. I, there, I know that the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World has banned anyone that's one of their ministers from calling themselves an apostle. You can't do it and not stay in the PAW. They just ban it because people are making up all these titles trying to make themselves be more important. It just, it's not about that. Do the work. The, now when Paul, when Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, he didn't say take the title of an evangelist. He told him to do that work. So doing the work is different than getting the title. Because there's a whole lot of folks that call themselves pastors and they do not do the work of a pastor. Matter of fact, the Bible says, he that, that desires the office of a bishop, and the word bishop means pastor. He that desires the office of a bishop desires a good work. Not that you should be going around calling yourself bishop. It's work. All right. Is that it? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. She said, in our assembly, what would be, what would we consider an appropriate title for the sisters that are in ministry? Minister or evangelist? And I, I think minister is what we call the sisters until they get licensed and then evangelist. Is it, um, is it an offensive thing, sisters? Do y'all have a problem with that? I'm not, no, no, you're asking the question. I'm not, I'm not trying to imply any way that by asking that question that you're offended. I'm not trying to say that at all. I'm asking the sisters in general, is that a problem? Good. I was about to tear somebody up. <laughs> all right. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Well, all right. She needs to make an announcement. Go on and make your announcement now. And then you dismiss. <laughs>